What's up guys, Keio here, and it's time we talk about someone who was long overdue for a dedicated video, LeBron James. During his 19th year, LeBron is showing he's still one of the best players in the league, as he's putting up around 29 points a game along with 7.5 rebounds and 8.5 assists a night. Despite that, the rest of the Lakers have been a mess. With injuries, COVID, and awkward roster fits, it seems like this is going to be another team that LeBron has to backpack if they want any chance of competing for a championship, even though this was supposed to be the time AD was supposed to take the lead as the best player on the team. With that being said, we're going to talk about the wide range of supporting casts LeBron has had throughout his career. It's crazy how quickly the supporting cast around him have changed from year to year since he left for Miami in 2010. It's resulted in some squads that were incredible from top to bottom, and some that would have surely been in the lottery if LeBron wasn't on the team. So today, we're going to take a look at both the best and worst supporting cast of each era of LeBron's career. Here are the periods we'll look at. The first Cleveland stint, the Miami Heatles, the second Cleveland stint, and his time with the Lakers. Starting with the first Cleveland stand, 2008 was his worst team, as this was the first indication that the Cleveland front office wasn't ever going to put a great roster around LeBron. You would think that after making an ahead of schedule trip to the finals that Cleveland would enter win now mode, bolster up their roster, and go all in on a title. But instead, they became stagnant and didn't make any real moves to try and improve their team. On top of not making any meaningful moves, Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen teamed up with Paul Pierce in Boston, becoming the new favorite in the East. Compare that to LeBron's supporting cast of Drew Gooden, Larry Hughes, and Zdrinis Algauskas, it was clear that major changes needed to be made if they wanted any chance of competing with the Celtics. GM Danny Ferry heard the noise and made plenty of changes at the deadline. They weren't what you might expect. Instead of trying to get a reliable second scoring option to take the pressure off of LeBron, Cleveland pretty much swapped an average supporting cast for another average supporting cast, as they traded away Larry Hughes, Drew Gooden, Daniel Marshall, and Cedric Simmons for Ben Wallace, Wally Serbiak, Joe Smith, and Delonte West. After all that, this roster was still nothing special, and they had no time to gel as a team, which led to them going 15-13 and 13 post-trade deadline and finishing 45-37 and 37 for the season. In the playoffs, they got bounced in the second round in a surprisingly long seven-game series against the Celtics. If this team had more time together or a second option, they may have had a real chance of getting back to the finals. But they got complacent after their run from the year prior and gave LeBron his worst supporting cast during his contending years at Cleveland, which is an early indicator that the Cavs might not be the best long-term option for the King. After seeing that they desperately needed a strong second option to take the load off of LeBron offensively, the Cavs finally made a good decision as they received Mo Williams in a three-team trade during the 08 offseason. Williams was coming off of a season where he averaged 17 points and 6 assists a game. While these numbers weren't eye-popping, he was the first real second option LeBron ever had in his career, which ended up going a long way for the team. Cleveland also kept their core from last season's deadline moves and gave them a full training camp to actually learn how to play with one another, which led to them becoming a true force to be reckoned with. With a reliable second option, great space Racing and an elite team defense, this Cavs team won 66 games, which is the best record in the NBA. Mo Williams was the first teammate of LeBron to be named to an all-star team. LeBron won his first MVP award, and head coach Mike Brown won coach of the year as well. Despite the great bounce back year, they ended up losing in the conference finals against the Magic, as prom Dwight Howard was simply a matchup nightmare for this team. They tried to improve in 2010 by signing Shaq and trading for Antoine Jameson, but both of those moves ended up falling flat as neither player was very impactful when it mattered. On top of that, Mo Williams regressed from his all-star form and the defense took a step back as well, which leaves the 2009 team as the best team of his first stint. The worst team of LeBron's Miami days were easily the first rendition of this team in 2011. After signing LeBron, Bosh, and bringing Wade back, there really wasn't much room for this team to work with in terms of building out the rest of the roster, and it showed throughout the season. They never quite figured out who the complimentary players were to fill out the rest of the starting lineup, mainly because they didn't have any starting caliber players on the team outside of the big three. Carlos Arroyo started at point guard in the beginning of the season, only for him to be replaced by Mario Chalmers. And then Bibby ended up replacing Arroyo when he signed as a backup midseason. Although Chalmers would go on to fit alongside the big three really well in the years to come because of his floor spacing, he wasn't quite ready to be the starting point guard for a championship team at this point. At center, they tried starting guys like Zadrina Salgauskas and Eric Dampier, who were both 35 years old, but then settled on Joel Anthony as their starting big man come playoff time. And as you probably expected, none of these three offered much production. And then their bench was rounded out with the likes of Mike Miller, James Jones, Eddie House, and Jawan Howard. No player on the team outside of LeBron, Wade, and Bosch averaged double figures or was truly above average at defense, playmaking, or rebounding. So unlike his time in Cleveland where he had decent role players with no Robin, LeBron had incredible second and third options with Wade and Bosch, but still didn't have a truly competent roster yet due to the sharp drop off in talent. They finished with a record of 58-24 and and could have won a championship this year thanks to Wade, who played great during the finals. But if one of the big three was struggling, it was really tough for this team to win games. And after LeBron's infamous choke job, his supporting cast didn't have what it took to get them over the hump. So because of the lack of anything outside of the big three, this was definitely LeBron's worst Miami team. Moving on to the 2013 Heat. This team is not only the best team LeBron has ever had, but one of the finest assembled rosters in NBA history. 
It of course features James, Wayne, and Bosch, but the biggest change this year compared to 2011 was the supporting cast. After seeing what the Big Three was capable of in 2011, a few key veterans came over to Miami to give them some much needed help to their bench unit. Shane Battier came over during the 2011 offseason and Ray Allen signed in the summer of 2012. With these two along with the addition of Chris Anderson rounding out the same core that already won the championship in 2012, the C team was scary good. Coach Spolster was also ahead of his time with his lineups this year. He moved Chris Bosch to center in addition of having four rotational players not named LeBron shoot 40% or above from three. This small ball lineup led the Heat to the best record in the league with 66 wins, highlighted by their 27 game winning streak, which is the second longest in NBA history. That winning streak ended up gassing this team out down the stretch though, and likely played a part in Wade's knees giving him so much trouble throughout the playoffs. His numbers took a notable dip during the postseason, but unlike 2011 where they needed the entire big three to play well in order to win, the rest of the Miami rotation stepped up and got the job done. Aside from LeBron's stellar performance in the finals, Ray Allen hit one of the biggest shots of all time in Game 6, and Shane Battier also made six huge threes in Game 7. These key contributions from role players is something that has eluded LeBron for much of his career, which is why this 2013 team is the best supporting cast he's ever had. I don't think there was any surprise here. The 2018 Cavs were a disaster from start to finish. They went through a major roster transformation mid-season, had one of the worst defenses in the league, and still somehow made the finals, which is honestly one of the greatest achievements of LeBron's career. During the prior offseason, Kyrie demanded a trade, which led to the Cavs sending him to Boston for a package including Jay Crowder and a damaged Isaiah Thomas. From there, the only pieces they added were a still injury-riddled Derrick Rose and a washed-up Dwayne Wade. After an awful stretch where they went 6-11, highlighted by a 32-point loss to the Rockets on their home floor, Cleveland sent Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Derrick Rose, and Dwayne Wade packing up the trade deadline for various pieces including Jordan Clarkson, Larry Nance, Rodney Hood, and George Hill. While the team ended up improving a bit to close out the season, this roster did not have the star power to compete with other contenders around the league, let alone the KD-led Warriors. But on top of that, most of them folded come playoff time. Kevin Love was up and down this postseason, but aside from a big Jeff Green performance in Game 7 at Boston, LeBron pretty much did everything on his own, which led to thumbnails like this on YouTube. No moment better represents the Cavs' 2018 playoff run than Game 1 of the Finals, where LeBron found George Hill under the basket, which led to a pair of free throws with the game on the line. After making the first free throw to tie the game, Hill, an 80% free throw shooter, missed a potential go-ahead free throw, and then J.R. Smith grabbed the offensive rebound and dribbled out the clock instead of literally doing anything else. To make matters even worse, the Cavs had a timeout they could have called but didn't use. All of this came during arguably the best game of LeBron's career, when he went off for 51 points in a losing effort. If this doesn't sum up LeBron's last year in Cleveland, I don't know what else does. As a whole, LeBron's 2018 playoff run was absolutely incredible. It's just a shame he did it with one of the worst supporting casts of his career. Moving on to his best Cavs team, the 2017 Cavs were one of the most forgotten about teams in NBA history, mainly because they didn't end up winning the championship. But this was the best team LeBron had ever had in Cleveland. He unfortunately just ran into arguably the greatest team of all time in the finals. This Cavs team, for the most part, brought back their entire roster from the 2016 championship. LeBron, Kyrie, Kevin Love, Jarrett Smith, and Tristan Thompson started, with Amon Shumpert, Richard Jefferson, and Channing Frye rounding out the rotation on the bench. But this was a year Kevin Love finally seemed to have figured out his role as a third option in Cleveland, and he made his first all-star appearance with the Cavs. On top of that, they made a mid-season trade for Kyle Korver, which gave them a spark off the bench that made their offense become truly lethal. This team only won 51 games and finished second in the East, but that's largely due to them coasting to save their energy for an all but guaranteed finals matchup with Golden State. They famously flipped the switch once the playoffs began, and they absolutely dominated the Eastern Conference, going 12-1 in the process to make their way back to the finals. During their decimation of the Eastern Conference, they scored a blistering hot 120 points per 100 possessions on a team-effective field goal percentage of 59.8, which is the highest in NBA history. Their offense was just simply unstoppable, as this was Kyrie, Kevin Love, and LeBron at their absolute best together. Like I said before, they ran into one of the only teams in NBA history that were able to match their scoring prowess. While Cleveland put up a great 114.8 points per game on an all-time great defense of the Warriors, Golden State was just too much for the Cavs to handle, as they scored an absurd 121 points per game to win the finals in five. Overall, this Cavs team wasn't anything special defensively, but it was all-time great offensively when it mattered, and likely would have won the championship if they ran into anybody else besides the Kevin Durant-led Warriors. While it's tempting to mark this year's Lakers as LeBron's worst LA squad because of their dysfunction, I still think it's a bit too early to jump to that conclusion just because Anthony Davis and LeBron have both missed so many games this year. So until we see an extended stretch with their full big three, I think the 2019 Lakers are a safe bet for his worst supporting cast of this period. When LeBron signed with the Lakers in the summer of 2018, he joined an extremely promising young core consisting of Brandon Ingram, Kyle Kuzma, Lonzo Ball, and Josh Hart. 
In addition to signing LeBron, JaVale McGee, Lance Stevenson, Michael Beasley, and Rondo joined the team in the offseason as well. This was seen as a transitional year for the Lakers as they tried to figure out who was going to stay and who was going to be a part of a trade package to pair another star with LeBron. They finished with a gaudy record of 37-45 and 45 and missed the playoffs, but this team is actually much better than people remember. On Christmas Day, they beat the Warriors to improve to a respectable 20-14, and 14, good for fourth in the West at the time. But this is when the injury bug struck the team, starting with LeBron, which went on to derail their entire season. Even though this team is better than their record showed, this was the only LeBron-led LA team that had no real championship aspirations. At the end of the day, the young core that LeBron joined was still years away from developing into the high-level players they are today. There was just no way they were going to be a legit playoff contender with a bunch of 21 and 22-year-olds with no playoff experience as his supporting pieces. So even though this was one of the most comedic teams in NBA history, it's also his worst LA supporting cast. After an underwhelming first year that I just mentioned, LA decided it was time to win now and traded their young core to the Pelicans in exchange for superstar big man Anthony Davis. Despite the blockbuster trade that gave the Lakers arguably the best duo in the league, they were going to have to push all the right buttons during 2019 free agency if they wanted to maximize what they had and potentially win a championship. And that's exactly what they did. I don't really know why the league has decided to move so far away from this these last couple of seasons, but this 2020 team utilized LeBron as the point guard and used a guard rotation of Danny Green, Avery Bradley, and Catavius Caldwell-Pope to chase around guards and hit open threes. LeBron handled the playmaking, and AD and JaVale McGee locked down the paint. And then Rondo, Alex Caruso, Dwight Howard, and Kyle Kuzma filled out the rest of the rotation as reserves. Offensively, this team did have its challenges. Outside of LeBron and AD, Kyle Kuzma was the only other player to average double figures, but he himself underachieved in his expected new role as an efficient third option. But on defense, this team was spectacular. For the most part, every player in the rotation was above average to elite on the defensive end. With so much of their money already invested in LeBron and AD, Rob Polinka smartly filled the rest of the rotation with capable defenders at their positions. Add that to the defensive monster that Anthony Davis was this season, it made sense why this team had the third best defensive rating in the league at 104.6. With a lockdown defense and Anthony Davis able to take just enough of the scoring load off of LeBron's shoulders, this was a really solid team. And to this day, I still don't know why the Lakers decided to move away from LeBron at point guard. It resulted in easily the best team he had in Los Angeles and was one of the best teams of his career. And on that note, that's all I have for you guys today. Let me know what you think of my rankings in the comments. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.